can hear us okay. You know, as you can see, we did decide to follow protocol and wear masks since we're less than six feet apart, but we felt like it was really important to do this as a joint presentation because we do work so closely together on a lot of these projects. And we thought if we're gonna be talking about cooperative management that we should give a cooperative presentation. So thanks so much for having us. I imagine a lot of people on here are already property managers that are grazing their properties. Um, or maybe you have a wetland that you're thinking about grazing. And so we thought it might be helpful to share some of our experience working in the rainwater basin today. So first we thought it was important to start with some background and just introducing folks to the rainwater basin. Um, so it's a, a 6,150 square mile wetland complex. And there's about 21 counties or parts of 21 counties encompassed within this 160 mile wide stretch of South Central Nebraska. And what it's really well known for are these playa wetlands, you know, that are usually contain water in the spring, but are typically dried up by late summer or fall. And this is a really important part of the country because the central flyway is at its narrowest point along this 160 mile stretch. So we have almost 10 million waterfowl that are coming through the area February and March. And then we've got a lot of shorebirds that are following right on their heels. So it's a very ecologically important part of the country. And like most areas in the country, we're losing wetlands. Uh, historically, the rainwater basin had about 11,000 individual playa wetlands. So pretty exciting to have over 200,000 acres that a lot of these waterfowl could depend on every spring. But today, over 82% of those wetlands have been converted to agriculture. And I provided the map at right because I feel like it really illustrates this, this well where this isn't the whole rainwater basin, but this image was provided by the Upper Big Blue Natural Resources District, and it shows the change in agricultural practices. So every blue circle shows where a central pivot is irrigating that corridor section or that section. Um, and then the blue is a subsurface drip irrigation. So I like this map because you can see how very little of the area in that nine county parcel in the eastern half of the rainwater basin it is covered in grasslands or wetlands. You can really see how much of the area is dominated by agriculture right now. In fact, wetlands only comprise about 1% of the whole rainwater basin at this point. Um, and they're so rare at this point that they were given a priority one ranking within the Nebraska Wetlands Priority Plan. So you can imagine how this creates an issue where we've got 10 million waterfowl trying to migrate through in the area and so little wetland for them to forage in. So most of the land that's in the basin is under private ownership, which mostly means that it's being farmed into corn or soybeans at this time. So grasslands are about 20% of the region and we do have some woodlands, but it's pretty much relegated to steep uh, hillsides, uh, riverine systems along the area. And I just threw in this picture because it's kind of a typical wetland for us. Most of our sites are, are only 30 to 50 acres. A lot of times it's just a quarter out of that farmer's 160 acres that he's decided to, to enroll in a wetlands reserve program easement. But I kind of like this picture because if you look closely, you can see all the semis in the background. So this is a wetland that's just nestled in between the farmer's corn and the interstate. So in 1990, the Farm Bill passed the first wetlands reserve program. And this was an incredible achievement. You know, it allowed us to set aside these wetlands that we could preserve for future generations and, and hopefully restore them you know, to some extent so that they would be valuable for, for, well, or for wildlife. But unfortunately, what we discovered is that preserving them is not enough. You know, a lot of these wetlands evolved with disturbances, whether that was bison grazing or fire coming through, some sort of disturbance in order to really rejuvenate those wetlands. And without that, you know, they, they were starting to relegate themselves to just fallow looking fields. So one of the things that the Rainwater Basin Joint Venture and a lot of our partners decided to do was to try to step in and help these landowners manage these wetlands so that we could see some, some benefits to the plant communities. So we started entering into 10-year agreements with these landowners to help them manage it. And we found the best way to do that was to try to promote grazing as a way to uh, encourage those desirable species we wanted and discourage the undesirables. And it's a really good deal for the landowners. Uh, between our partners and ourselves, we're able to provide up to 85% of the cost share for the grazing infrastructure, which generally includes a fence and a well and livestock tanks. The only real eligibility requirements are that the landowner has to have at least 30 acres and they have to be involved in some conservation program such as WRP or uh, some of the wetland uh, practices within CRP would qualify as well. 
In the past 10 years, the Rainwater Basin Joint Venture has been able to install grazing infrastructure on over 56 different easements. Um, again, a lot of times this would include fencing or a well or tank. You know, again, if we're going to put the time in and spend money on these properties, we want to make sure that the landowners are using them and that they're able to have cattle effectively graze the property. The exciting thing is, is that out of these 56 easements, uh, we're seeing more and more every year. So right now we've actually got 18 of those easements in various stages, or I should say an additional 18 easements are undergoing construction right now, where they're either getting bid out or having construction occur as we speak. Um, and I did want to provide a couple photos for you. Uh, the upper right photo, I just wanted to show a typical quarter post. We usually use wood or we use hedge for the wood post and we follow all NRCS fencing and well drilling spe specifications. So you can see that we've got a wood post every fifth post. These are supposed to be 50 year fences. You know, if we're gonna invest in them, we want them to last. And you can see by looking at uh, the livestock guards built around the tank and the, the solar well there, that that's definitely built to last too. I think our contractors were a little overzealous there and planning for bison, but uh, that works for cattle too, for keeping them out. We do also fund a few other projects too, really anything that we feel is going to facilitate that landowner being able to effectively graze his wetland. So I want to show another example. Uh, this project is in Fillmore County. It belongs to Stu Luddick. And you can see it's, it's a really nice wetland actually with a lot of uh, moist soil species that are highly desirable, It'd be excellent for grazing, but we were all able to fence it for many years. It's kind of hard to see, but um, you can see there's a pivot tower right there in the back and the pivot going off here. And he had a pipeline that was carrying water all the way across this land from the pivot to the well. So one thing we were able to do was provide funding to put in an underground pipeline so that we could easily transport that water. But the main thing is now we're able to put up a fence and there's no obstruction in the way so that we can graze that property. Um, another property that we worked on was this Olson property. The line in red shows the perimeter fence that was already installed previous years ago but the landowner felt that he could get a better response if he was able to more quickly rotationally graze his cattle. And so he requested we assist him with cross fencing. So the pink dash is where we're planning to put these cross fences, fences in here in the next month. And it will allow him to rotate. And as Crystal will talk about here later, that's gonna be really important so that we can get the response we need from those communities. Uh, I also wanted to show the Hammond WRP easement that we have in York County. Um, you can see that the wetland part of the property pretty much bisects the entire part of this easement. And so what we're proposing is to put in a culvert here and a culvert here. So as he lets cattle in the gate here, they're not getting trapped in this drier area because sometimes in wet years they're unable to, or they're unwilling rather to, to walk through the wetland. So again, not a typical project. We're not talking about putting up fence here. It's already there, but we want to ensure that we increase accessibility. We want people to actually actively graze these properties. All right, so in the last 10 years, as I mentioned, we've had 56 different wetlands that have had grazing infrastructure installed. And I wanted to share this map. I think it's a nice visual of the, uh, the distribution that we have of these properties across the rainwater basin. You can see we've got some key focal areas that we've really focused on. Uh, but right now we've got properties in 12 counties and we've got over 6,700 acres of fencing installed on these properties that otherwise would have just been sitting idle. So, you know, we started to pat ourselves in the back and start thinking like, we've got all these properties, we've got all these managers that are, all these landowners that are helping us out. But one thing that we also quickly realized was that unfortunately most landowners don't actually own cattle anymore. You know, as farms have become less diversified, it just so happens that a lot of landowners um, really focus on just the land or they don't have access to cattle. So it wasn't doing us a lot of good to build all of this fence and not have anything or not have any way to graze it. So the next step that we took was starting to develop what we're calling the Rainwater Basin Cattle Grazers Network. And through this network, we're hoping to provide that connection between the landowners and the cattle grazers that are looking for land. I've talked to a lot of the folks from the Cattle Grazers Network or from the Cattle Grazers Associations here in Nebraska. And they've said that there are a lot of young farmers looking for more land. They just don't know how to, how to reach out. And obviously we have easement owners that are excited to have cattle now that they have all this infrastructure and don't have access. So anyways, we're building a page to the website. I'll be sure to share the link with everybody as soon as we get it finalized here. But basically we'll have cattle grazers jump on and just register to say, or to share their contact information 
and how many acres they would like to graze on and what counties they're willing to travel to so that they can graze some of these easements for us. Uh, we also have port portable livestock corral available so that they can move and transport their cattle. And again, we're just hoping to bridge that, that gap between all of these easements and the grazers. So once again, we feel like, all right, we've taken every step, right? We've set aside the land through WRP. We've put grazing infrastructure on it so that we can make sure that we're achieving objectives and building the right plant communities that we wanna see out there. And now we're even providing this list of grazers that wanna come out and graze it. But it turns out that's still not the end of the story. <laughs> At some point, we need to make sure that we're, we're managing these properties so that both wildlife and cattle are seeing benefits. So I'm gonna let Crystal jump in now and describe how we're writing up grazing prescriptions for folks. Hi everyone. Uh, I just wanna point out that I specifically work with the Wetland Reserves Program or Wetland Reserve Easement Program. Um, I typically provide guidance to the landowners enrolled in the program um, and I help them follow NRCS guidelines and specifications. So once the landowners uh, have their easement fixed and ready for grazing, how do they know what stocking rates to use and how long to leave the cattle on their wetlands? We recommend that everyone read this paper as shown on the slide on grazing rainwater basin wetlands. I will give a very brief summary in this presentation. There are many benefits to grazing, such as increasing suitable habitat for wetland dependent species, specifically migrating waterfowl, as Courtney stressed already, but as well as for shorebirds, muskrats, beavers, and so on. If using grazing correctly, it decreases the presence of undesirable species and increases the diversity without, uh, because without it, it will become thick and dominated by cattails, river bulrush, or reed canary grass. It also can increase the bare, so bare soil for shorebirds who depend on it. And it not only ben benefits the habitat, but as well for the landowner as it generates income. Grazing benefits the site by allowing for a shift in plant communities and as well as for cattle as it can provide adequate nutrition. It is important tool to use management to replicate the disturbance that bison created when they roamed the Great Plains. So if your objective is to control reed canary grass, the success, success of management depends on the stocking rate, timing, and utilization of other management tools, such as spraying, chemicals, prescribed burning, or reseeding. Uh, while managing for reed canary grass, it should be grazed before the plant reaches a foot in height, as it will became, become less palatable and the cows will only nibble on it and choose other plants to eat. The paper suggests to use a high stocking rate of 1 to 1.5 animal unit months or AUMs in the spring and early summer and in the fall to have the most impact. If your objective is to control cattails and river bulrush, the best strategy to use is to use a higher grazing intensity and in a shorter durations compared to reed canary grass with the utilization of cross fence. The best time to graze is in the spring and early summer with additional management practices such as prescribed burning, spraying, or even disking. But it's important to know that supplementation for the cattle may be needed if they're being forced to only graze cattails and river bulrush as it can have a negative impact on their health. Grazing is not only important for managing for undesirable species, it is also vital for maintaining a good moist soil community. Species often found in the rainwater basin wetlands are smartweeds, sedges, rushes, spike rushes, and barnyard grass which are all very important forage for waterfowl species. It provides an important crude protein percentage for both the wildlife and cattle. It is comparable to other plant communities, but the forage production is lower. So a reasonable stocking rate for maintaining plant soil communities is five to 10 acres per cow-calf pair. 
It is also best to rotationally graze with upland or other wetland vegetation communities. By varying timing, intensity, and duration of how the site is grazed, it promotes the diversity of species. Grazing it the same year to year will likely lead to fewer to few species being favored. Now, if the site is not managed properly, the community can shift from being dominated to being dominated by reed canary grass, cattails, or river bulrush. If the site is moderately grazed from year to year, you can see positive results about 85% of the time. Seed production is greater when the site is grazed versus rested since it needs disturbance to promote it. It is best to graze no longer than mid-July so the stand does not decline and instead maximizes plant recovery time and seed production. I normally like for sites to be grazed as early as they can uh, so there's enough forage present, present, present sorry, and pull the cows at the latest of July 15th, sometimes sooner if it's being grazed with the upland. Um, but it is best to graze the property and maintain the community because once it shifts to invasive species, it is hard for the community to come back to the way it was. It is important to determine what your objectives are before making a grazing plan. It depends a lot if you want to manage or maintain the site. Grazing the site later could lead to an increase in diversity, but eventually, will lead to a to it degrading if undesirable species are not being managed for. It's important to remember that no site is alike and it may change from year to year. So you must just adjust with the property. If you are continuously stocking at high rates, it can cause a severe stand loss and nutritional stress on the cows. So you want a happy land and happy cows. Two minutes left. Okay, uh, the paper that I summarized is a great guideline on how to manage wetlands. So now I'm gonna look at a specific example, this Reeb WRP. Um, here I have listed the uh, guidelines I normally follow when taking action. So the Reeb WRP is a per perfect example on how I coordinated with Courtney, a partner to the NRCS and with the landowner. Courtney and I both met with Richard on site and she discussed uh, options for grazing infrastructure and I talked about uh, what his goals were and how to graze the site. Uh, so here on the map you can see that I made I mapped out the different plant communities present and so as you can see that I marked that there's reed canary grass present on the site so that is in that's why I decided on making that my management goal for at least the first part of the grazing plan. So I used this after I mapped it out and I figured out the area percent of area the communities are, I utilized this grazing calculator made by Nadine Bishop, who is the NRCS State Rangeland Management Specialist. So here I figured out the acres of each wetland type and included the upland on that. And that then gives me the percent or the acres of the community area. And then from that, uh, it gives me the forage production values, which are shown on this part of the calculator. Uh, so I insert in what the cattle numbers I want to use or the days I want to follow. And it kind of computes out my numbers. Uh, so. For Reebs, I'm grazing to have 25 cow calf pairs for about 30 days at 70% use. And so my goal is to focus on uh, creating a pressure on the reed canary grass when it's putting the, its most energy into it. So if you're interested in this calculator, you can contact me for a copy of it.
All right, now that we've captivated a bunch of wildlife biologists with a bunch of cow photos, we wanna make sure we take a minute to acknowledge all our major funding partners. Without them, none of this would be possible as they're helping contribute to that infrastructure. Uh, we also threw our email addresses up there. You can follow up if you have any other questions. And then of course, we wanted to throw in a link for the grazing of rainwater basin wetlands paper that we've alluded to. If you go to that UNL website and then in the search box, type in the title of the paper, that grazing rainwater basin wetlands, you'll be able to download a full copy and you can read the whole thing on your own. But with that, thank you very much. And we'd be happy to take questions or even perhaps maybe some of you would like to share some of your grazing success stories from properties you manage.